And so as we're recording and as we're doing live sound, um, we have to balance those frequencies because they mask each other. So a kick drum and a bass guitar is a great example of that. They're going to start fighting with each other because they want to be the most prominent at a frequency. So you find yourself, you turn up the kick because it disappears, and then you turn it up, and now the bass disappears. Bass disappears. And then you so turn the, the simple bass. way of fixing that is sidechain compression, which is Ben's <laughs> also another one of Ben's favorite no! techniques. <laughs> Don't we're, bother with that's not we're the talk- solution to everything. We're talking about EQ. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. My bad, guys. You're listening to the GWNL Podcast. Guys with no lives talking about audio. Hello and welcome to episode two of Sound Advice that we give to everybody. One could say that it's the foundation. <laughs> of everything that we're talking about. Okay, let's let's get into it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. today's question, today's topic on podcast episode two, equalization. What is EQ? Okay, who wants to take that one? First question of the night. What is EQ? I vote Ben. That's rude. He teaches this every day. <laughs> okay. I, okay. I kind of want to see brain day. struggle. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, it. this is uh, basically EQ. Well, the way I like to explain it to students is that um, the basic concept of it was developed with um, LPs or vinyl records before it was vinyl, actually, lacquer records. But the problem was mm-hmm. is that when you recorded on the record – it did not, it wasn't completely linear. And so when you played back, it didn't sound like what you had recorded. And so the idea was to, they started to figure out a way to add some gain in certain areas of different, of certain frequencies to make it sound more equal on the output to what the original recording was on the input. And so that's why it's called equalization to make the playback more equal to what the original recording was. And so, but all it really is, is it's, it's adding gain or attenuating. So amplifying or attenuating certain ranges of frequencies, as opposed to all of the frequencies together, which a regular amplifier or attenuator, attenuator being, meaning turning down like a fader would turn everything up or down. So it's like essentially having a, a lot of little faders across your, your frequency range, which they do have EQs that do exactly that, which are graphic EQs. So there you so go. So there, awesome. there are three types of equalization, right? Three? Or is it two? I know there's GEQs and parametric. Well, there's... Um, graphic there's equalizers. Fixed. And- so there's fixed EQs where you just have like, you know, three knobs that are like yeah. high, low, and mid. Right. And then you have parametric, which fully parametric is where you have three controls of every band, which is gain up and down frequency um, frequency and left Q. and right and then shape Q Q or yeah. shape so the the larger the Q number the the narrower it is and the lower the Q the wider, the wider it, is. it is it's like gauge it's inverse it's yeah. an inverse of it it's, it's a like, ratio so it's that's like, why it's, it's like ap- aperture in film yeah exactly photography yeah. um and then yeah and then there's graphic which is just like the little faders so they're really good on like i know for live sound applications i like geqs for um removing frequencies like any kind of feedback frequencies like monitors yeah. that's because you can use a parametric for that but like parametrics have a little bit uh, you can but you don't have as many um peqs or whatever you don't have as many cues to use different you know anyways whatever yeah yeah um also like geqs are used on like mains a lot that's a, another popular use for them before the advent of like modern systems control where you have like as many P- yeah. like as many eqs parametric eqs as you want because it's all digital and they can do whatever they want now on top of like rta assessment and whatever but anyways yeah um i'm doing a live sound gig on uh next next weekend and um the person that hired me to do it is adamant about using GQs. He has some like GQs. Um, he was like, we we have we have to use these on the mains just in case the uh, X32 fails. 
If it fails, you're not gonna have anything. Yeah, yeah like it. your concert's <laughs> over if that fails. Like, we 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 have <laughs> we have like three. We we have two backup consoles for this because it's in the middle of nowhere. Is this oh. is this like a Talking Heads thing or is it like a rock thing? Like it's a festival. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, All right, well. Yeah. Um, I did pull up. If we want to get into the history now, that we kind of talked a little bit about equalization. Do you? Yeah. Uh, do you want me to pull up the? I have the Wikipedia article. Yeah, yeah. If you yeah. want to share anything from that, for the record, everyone who is hearing this, you can read this as well on Wikipedia. I'm just reading directly <laughs> from the history section, so don't like. This is not my information. This is Wikipedia for the record. Okay. <clears throat> Open source. Oops. Yeah. Right. Open source. Filtering audio frequencies dates back at least to acoustic tele- telegraphy and multiplexing in general. Audio electronic equipment evolved in incorpor. Okay, whatever. Okay, so they talk a little bit about what equalization is in extremely technical terms, mind you. E- early filters included basic bass and treble controls featuring fixed frequency centers, like Ben was talking about, and fixed levels of cut or boost. So, like, think of not uh, not notches, but like you know, whatever. These filters worked over broad frequency ranges. Variable equalization in audio reproduction was first used by John Volkman working at. RCA in the 1920s. That system was used to equalize a motion theater, motion picture theater sound playback system. The Langevin model EQ251A was the first equalizer to use slide controls, kind of like predecessor to the GEQ. Featured two passive equalization sections, a bass shelving filter, a pan, a pass a band pass filter each filter yeah so they kind of talk about like all the different ones and a lot of it kind of is derivative of theater playback uh the first true graphic equalizer was the type 7080 developed by art davis um cinema engineering six bands with a boost and a cut of 8 db use slide switches um then he created another geq with uh, altec lansing the model 9062a is that ringing any bells with anybody yeah Okay, well, I tried. No, I'm I'm just thinking of like all the popular ones from like the um, 70s, 60s, 70s. Yeah, 60s, 70s, 80s. uh, That was a ways down the road. Yeah. Um, But this is like kind of the introduction. A lot of it is they're saying it was like originally for like theater and like video movie productions, which is fair. I think that makes sense. I think the, the important thing to realize is that you like nowadays we take for granted all the flexibility with like computers and digital stuff and yeah. like what they had to do just like electronically to just isolate one band of frequency and turn it up versus turn it down um you know or amplify it versus attenuate it or like it's like it's like quite crazy what they had to do just electronics wise and so that's why these were like these like units that were probably like three band EQs were probably like a three Ginormous. rack space, you know, thing with all these tubes in it and like big transformers. Tubes for yeah. days. So, and that's why it wasn't even like until the seventies that you had fully, fully parametric EQ. Right. So there was, well, now we have EQ. like things that deal with like phase and like how phase affects equalization compared to like back in the old days, you know, like, I know that uh, was it Fab Filter has their like linear phase and like phase adjustments for any like equalization move that you make because just changing the frequencies doesn't just change the frequencies like anything we do. There's like other things that yeah. it, like sympathetically affects get, and get affected. Yeah. So I think that there's there's a, a delineation we need to make too. Right. Keeping it simple is the difference between filters and EQs, and they often get like lumped together but like they are two distinct different things and as you were reading joe it was talking about filtering filters. frequencies it mentioned so the filters if you think of a filter like like a filter like a water filter you're keeping some stuff out and letting other stuff pass through so you're stopping some things letting others pass and so there's all these different pass filters so we've got like one of the most common and most used the high pass filter Yep. So not the low, low pass, pass filter. filter. <laughs> no, no, not the low pass filter. The high pass filter. Yeah. We use high passes. So I use the low pass pretty frequently. I use it on some things. Yeah. Low pass is more used in like synthesis and stuff like that too. Because yeah. there's so much high frequency created. But anyways, so what does a high pass filter do, Joe? 
a high pass filter gets rid of all those nasty lower frequencies, the subharmonic frequencies that muddy up or create problems. I use them in live sound to get rid of like people touching the boom stand or cut out those kinds of things, cut out wind noise um, to deal with some plosive like, you know, where you have like the air hitting the microphone and causing it to move. It helps deal with those problems. I use them on every track. You should never not use a high pass in a live sound. And well, there's always exceptions, but generally you're going to use high passes on every channel. Yeah. I even use it on my kick. Um, just not that high. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty low. It's like you said, for the sub harmonic stuff, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, even, even in the studio setting, I'll use a high pass filter on a kick. So maybe yeah. I'm maybe I'm mixing wrong, but no, I, I do that too. So. It's for the same purpose. Like if if you don't want your kick to overpower, stuff, and the subharmonics yeah. can do that. Yeah, and there's there's a couple of funny stories about that. So there was there was this one story about I think it was a Grammys show, yeah, that was being recorded, and they were recording it. The guy who was mixing it was doing it on NS10s because you know they're standard and stuff. But he didn't have a sub with the NS10. And so he's mixing it and everything, and it's he thinks it sounded fine. And then he gets these phone calls from the broadcasting people. They're like, what in the world is going on? And it was like every time they would move the camera, like, boom, like the roller thing for the camera, there was this big rumble. And it was picked <laughs> up on the mics, and he hadn't high-passed them. And so he, but he couldn't hear it because he didn't have a sub a on his sub, yeah. And it was this big rumble was getting through. I don't hear so, what you're talking about. <laughs> So, anyways, there's a there's a couple other fun stories with that. But so that's a high pass filter. It lets the highs pass through, and it stops the lows, right? Okay, and then the low pass filter is the opposite. So, so it, yeah. it stops the highs and lets the lows pass through. And the confusing thing is the alternate names, which is the high cut, which is the and same the, as the low pass, and the low cut is the same as the high pass. High pass. Yeah. Um, Inverse and, relationships, my friends. Yes, inverse. <laughs> so then there's the band pass, which is basically a high pass and a low pass together, together. which is like your telephone yeah. effect. Okay. Yeah, 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 and yeah. then you've got a notch filter, which is like the opposite, where it just takes out one frequency. So that's the one that's like a, a, a notch, a V that you slide back. That's good for yeah. like in live sound applications, obviously removing feedback loops and finding exactly. those problems. Yeah. Yeah, Notch it out. good for good for taking out resonances in a studio setting. Yeah, like that ringy snare, right? You don't want to get <laughs> no, I just don't... gate it harder <laughs> if you don't <laughs> want that ring. Um, okay, so that's the filters, and then like actual EQ, VEQ, and some <laughs> other EQ. I don't. Well, think those are like There's... styles of EQ, but EQ. yeah, I know. Yeah. The, the you've got e... you've got like a shelf, a bell. <clears throat> yeah, so the bell one. I've heard it called lots of things like a peak dip is what I usually call it, but it's called a bell too. But it's just where it's like a, a narrow band, you know, a band of, and that's the one that we were talking about that the, with the, the cue. cue will widen it and stuff. That's um, what most parametric seem to use is like yeah. the bell curve bell style. Curve. Yeah. 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 So it's just like the shelves and the peak dip or the bell. Um, right. And there's a high shelf and a low shelf, of course. And so Bryant, why don't you, Tell us what a shelf does. So a shelf will either boost or attenuate all the frequencies at a certain point and up if you're using a high shelf or all the frequencies from that point and below if it's a low shelf. It's like so. you set a point and you can adjust anything from that point over to whichever And then all, side. All, all those frequencies will boost. Yeah. So instead, like of just a, instead of just a certain area with like like a, a bell a bell curve or a peak dip, you focus on a certain area and so it'll do yeah. you know if you set one at like 400 hertz, it'll do about 400 hertz plus a little bit more. but if you set a high shelf at like 2,000 hertz, it'll do 2,000 hertz plus everything above that and all of that is boosting together. Also remember that depending on the EQ that you're using, like either plug in or the one you have at job, they will either have two options, which is gain and frequency, or they might have three options, which is gain frequency and Q. But the Q with the shelf is only going to adjust how aggressive it's going to adjust from that point down. You know what I mean? Kind of like the knee on a compressor. Yeah. It's like yeah. the slope of the shelf. Is right. it a yeah. slope? Is it a sharp cliff or is it a gradual? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can even have that with like different um, going back to filters, like a high pass filter. You can adjust like like times slow four times 12 or whatever. And it's yeah, just does, changing does like six, six dB an octave, 12 dB an octave, et cetera, right. et cetera. And it's just yeah. changing how aggressive that slope is. If you want it really like surgical, you're going to use like a times 24 or something like that. If you want it to be a little less surgical, a little bit more smoothly, it's going to be like a times six or times 12. 12. Yeah. And that, that like messes with the phase, which you were talking about the linear phase. Yeah. The, the sharper, the slope, the more phase, um, the more you have to like, like do to f- put it back into phase phase. Yeah. yeah. So, but anyways, um, that's more some, advanced. Yeah. Something, <laughs> something else is kind of interesting is the uh, API EQs. I think I like um, API, where it doesn't have a Q per se, but the uh-huh. higher the higher you boost the frequency, um, the more narrow the band gets of the. Yeah. So I, I think that those are pretty cool. Yeah, and that goes yeah. back to like we we're talking about the what they had to do with analog circuitry to make it work work. Like yeah. there was all these like side effects like that. And it's like, Hey, this is actually kind of cool, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, should we, so what common are their common uses? uses? Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about, you we know, kind of like, covered a lot of those as we've been going through, the, but the, like the, the general uh, use, I, I would say general use, you have subtractive and additive EQ. Like those are like, you're going to go through and look for your frequencies to cut. And then maybe if you want to boost certain frequencies to get something to sit better in a particular area, you will boost those frequencies that you find that are pleasing. One thing to be aware of, it is not wrong to boost. It is not wrong to cut, but it is important to realize that if you are boosting and you cut from it, like if you cut on the end of the track you cannot find yourself fighting against what you've done with your equalization if you boost in one place on that track and then you do an EQ later in that tra- that stem. And maybe I'm not doing it justice, but like you need to watch yourself with your additive and subtractive EQ when you're doing it in stages where you have like on the track and then on a bus and then on your master. It's very easy for people, and I've, I've fallen into this trap, where you'll boost something and then you'll cut it on the master. and. Master you're just fighting against yourself and so additive subtractive there's a whole argument out there that we're not going to get into that'll be a later episode (laughs) should 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 you should you just do subtractive should you just do additive the answer is it depends do do whatever you want to (laughs) do well i will say this i in live sound settings subtractive is safer because you are not adding to the gain structure of the signal source or the sound that's why they generally i totally agree with that And that's the only reason why I say that in like live, because you're dealing with amplification. And so when you're increasing the volume of certain frequencies, that's how you get feedback loops. And that's why they preach subtractive EQing. And I tend to do that, but I still will boost in live sound situations. I know like there are tons of people rolling over in their graves. In in, in a studio (laughs) setting, if in a studio setting, depending on the genre, you know, like on a kick, I will boost... 8k by like 15 db but in live i would never do that yeah right exactly all right so some of the common uses that i use eq for is removing like weird noises in like a sound like getting rid of feedback is a live sound thing like that's your number one is like your eq a lot of times um then there's things like tone shaping and and other things where you're you're like kind of getting things Ooh, ben here's one for you this is one of your favorites <clears throat> so tell us a little bit about the thing called uh, frequency masking this is one of the major <laughs> oh, common yes. uses okay well let's let's do this let's talk about the three purposes with this too then so okay. we'll talk about and these kind of cross over with the common uses so the three purposes are to use it to make stuff sound better okay so that's kind of what joe was talking about you're get you're finding those resonances and getting rid of them you're finding those pleasing parts and boosting them and just making it sound better in general that's one purpose of eq another purpose is as an effect and that's like where you're doing the the um the telephone thing exactly the telephone effect or you can take you do a a low 
a low pass filter and now it sounds like it's coming through a wall from a different room or you do a high pass filter and now it's sounding like it's an AM radio, which we never get to listen to anymore. So we don't even know what it sounds yeah. like yeah. or the telephone effect, which I realized that they've updated the telephones in the last couple of years. So it's like full bandwidth. So it doesn't even, I know. Yeah. <laughs> there's no <So>. telephone effect. <laughs> the cell phone so, effect we destroyed it. So those are the, those are the first two. The third one, which it doesn't really matter the order, but um, the third one is the most important one. And this one is dealing with frequency masking. And it's it's often referred to as balancing frequencies. Um, there's a couple different ways people talk about it. But basically what it is, is frequency masking is this psychoacoustic thing that our brains do. And it is what makes it so that we can go into a crowd and not get overwhelmed because we hear every single conversation that's happening around us. Because technically our ears are picking up every conversation that's around us within earshot. But our brains are basically saying which which frequencies are the most are the loudest and then anything that's the same frequency but less like less amplitude in that don't pay attention to. So if you're talking to somebody really close mm. to you, they're the loudest at those talking frequencies. You're going to hear them, but you're not going to hear the person right behind them in another conversation because your brain is masking those frequencies. So this kind of thing happens all over and it helps us to like not be overwhelmed. Um, but it happens in all the music we hear too. And so as we're recording and as we're doing live sound, um, we have to balance those frequencies because they mask each other. So a kick drum and a bass guitar is a great example of that. They're going to start fighting with each other because they want to be the most prominent at a frequency. So you find yourself, you turn up the kick because it disappears and then you turn it up and now the bass disappears. Bass disappears. And then you turn So the, the simple bass. way of fixing that is side chain compression, which is Ben's <laughs> also another one of Ben's favorite no! techniques. <laughs> Don't bother which, with that's not we're the talk, solution to everything. We're talking about EQ. <laughs> oh right, sorry, my bad guys. <laughs> sorry. The joke is sidechain compression is kind of overused in some instances when you can get away with using like proper EQing can actually do a lot of good rather than just side chaining everything yeah yeah wait nice and, save and, there nice save yeah <laughs> educational <laughs> but yeah so um the problem is is then you want to, what you want to do is what brian was saying is like you you find and cut out of of some you know cut out some frequencies out of one and boost out of the other like so with the kick and the bass maybe you boost on your kick at 60 hertz and you cut at 100 hertz and then the bass, you cut at 100 hertz. I mean, cut at 60 hertz and boost at 100 hertz. So or like 140, kind of, yeah, whatever. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and that's variable. Um, it could be anywhere. And this is happening all through your mix. So it's going to happen with your lead vocal and your piano or your guitar yeah. or your synth. The um, And it's you know it's happening in the high frequencies, the mid-range, and the low. And so you, that's what the main, one of the main, the main purpose of EQ really, especially in mixing is dealing with this sort of thing, dealing with the frequency masking that's happening and balancing all these frequencies. Which a really good way, if you can do it in your DAW or your system is if you have both of your EQs up, you can just like a kick in a bass. I do this all the time. I'll have both of my EQs up and whatever, like, I know I'm going to be not, you know, I'll be cutting at a certain point, like 100 hertz from my kick or like a little bit, you know, and I'll be boosting my bass there. And I can see both of them right next to each other. So if you put your EQs next to each other, if you have that ability, do it. It makes it a lot easier than trying to like, oh, I think it was like right around here or like writing down in notes. It's a lot easier to just see it visually. Or, so my, my favorite way is I'll, I'll do the uh, EQ moves on the kick. Like I'll boost 60 hertz, cut it 100, and then I'll copy that EQ onto the bass and then just reverse the uh, gain yeah. for them. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. So Yeah. And that's uh, a, it's like a balancing act. That's why it's called balancing frequencies. So you're constantly like adjusting things. And it's yeah. like, you know, and obviously compression like weighs in on that too. Uh, and so yeah. um, I, I had to explain. Yeah, exactly. But I had to explain this to a client one time because they wanted like they wanted every everything like the same level, like all the vocals. And it was just this this really difficult balancing act because as you as you brought one up and EQ'd it a little differently, it affected everything else. And I gave him this example from this movie where 
is an adventure movie and and these people found themselves on this like platform that was on this like center point and it was square or whatever and as they went from one side to the other it tilted over and so they had this to in star wars episode three when no. anakin's fighting obi-wan no it's not on the river of death no it's national treasure too oh that one oh okay i haven't so i haven't seen number two okay so you should watch it so you can learn about eq right? or just watch episode three <laughs> it's the same thing anyways but yeah in that in that in that section of national treasure too yeah um they're on this like tilting thing and they have to move around. And as one person moves off to one side, it affects the other side. So like what I explained to this guy, what he wanted was like taking all the people and having them all stand on the edges, you know, which is really tough. If you think about doing that, every have to like get in the middle and then slowly move out. So your whole mixing experience is like doing that. It is like this balancing act, um, which is, you call it balancing a mix and balancing frequencies. They use that term all the time. And it, if you visually think of it that way, it really helps. So. And I think it's also really important to realize that balance, when we consider EQing and, and volume and gain and all that stuff, sometimes balance is out of balance. And, and I'm going to put it that way. Like the lead vocal in most rock tracks tends to be the prominent voice by design. And so there are certain things that you will sit further back in that mix. And I always, yeah. And like EQing is the same way. Like there are certain parts of the frequencies and I want to point this out because we want to talk about basic techniques. Let's talk about kick drum. There are certain parts of the kick drum that need to be brought out. There are three. There's the thud, the whap, and the tap. Those are the elements that make up the sound of a kick drum. There's more to the frequencies than that, but those are the three elements that we look for when we hear it. I'm going to psychoacoustics to define what we understand something to be a, a kick drum. So like EDM producers will always take like different parts and pieces of like, you know, kick drums and whatever, and they'll like mash them together to create their own customized sound of a kick drum from samples, which is kind of the same thing that we do when we mic with like two or three different mics on an instrument or another thing. We're trying to capture more of those things. Another way that we can do that, where we can capture more of the thud or the whap or the tap is EQing. Instead of just putting a, instead of putting a micro, or instead of putting a microphone on the, um, on that, on the dirt, the head of the kick drum where it's getting hit, we can actually like go to around like, you know, 6k to like 10k, depending on whatever, and find that tap sound that you get from the EQ. And this is a good time to boost it. Oh, I need more tap on my kick drum to bring it out more. Get a nice clicky kick. Yeah. And like, that's a thing. Like there's like a lot of EDM that uses like a clicky kick sound. And anyways, well, that, that's even used in like, rock and metal too yeah especially like, metal has really tappy it's, kicks. yeah because you got you got that like super super fast double kick going yeah that has to be articulate right and you bring out that articulation by boosting those high frequencies yeah but yeah the the thud is obviously the low frequency that's the gutty gutsy thing and the whap is the low mid that is like hitting you in the chest which they're all important but it's true, like, and there's other styles yeah. of music, like hip hop and rap, where it's all about the thud. thud Maybe right. it's just the yeah. thud and the whap. But every instrument has its characteristics, and those are great little fun onomatopoeia type words to yeah. describe. There's some cool like EQ charts on the internet. Like I've I've found them where they'll talk about like, oh, these are like your general spots for the bass or the kick drum or the toms or whatever. A lot of times They're, like it's a little bit more for like drums, but th- those are su- those are super helpful, except for especially for like um mm-hmm. like starting out. When you're starting out and you don't really know what you're doing as far as mixing goes, maybe find one of those charts and kind of follow along, like try to mix your song. As that chart says, don't do it exactly as it is, but like use your ears still. But. It's a good starting point to move from those yeah. like key areas is the way I yeah. like to think about them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was thinking about a concept of yeah. equalization that I think is kind of interesting. And that's in the arrangement talking about like frequency masking and stuff. If you have, you know, oh. if you have like strings that are playing in, mm-hmm. in between like, you know, C3 and C4, and then you have your keys playing in between C3 and C4, and then you have your vocalist singing between C3 and C4, and then your yep. guitar is playing in between C3 and C4, it's going to be really, really difficult to make those sound good. But another, like, 
a thought on mixing is that you know you don't necessarily want every sound to be heard all the time throughout the song right if you hear every sound throughout the song generally it kind of is like a boring or stale mix you want the song to have an ebb and a flow like the chorus should be a louder section it should rather it should feel more energetic or more of that emotion from the prior section of the song so to speak yeah Uh, you want to you want to help move things along right yeah to clarify it's not that because like if we go back to the basic rules of mixing, we want everything to be audible. It's not that it it's there, but it's not audible. You're talking about actually changing the arrangement so that something just like stops playing or, or is more noticeable. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it brought up something else that I actually run into quite a bit. Um, so I have a vocalist that I work with regularly. She's great. She's a fantastic vocalist, very talented. And one of the struggles that I've run into is we were doing a performance of a pretty well-known um, pop punk song and pop punk the, yeah pop punk yeah <laughs> brian's triggered <laughs> um, <laughs> she was singing it now the original singer sang it in a tenor he's a tenor vocalist and most a lot of pop punk kind of a lot of the male vocal range is kind of at the upper part of their range for her to fit it in the same key she has to sing at her like lower part of her range because if she sings it at her upper part of her range she's not going to have enough to make it to the chorus where she takes it up higher you know like up another fifth i ran into this problem where now my vocalist which was sitting fine in the mix with every other song we've done on our set is now gone mm. because her range this is and this is my key point so her range and where she's singing in her range affects how she's going to fit in that mix now you can eq it but like nine times out of ten like in a live situation i'm going to ride the fader because eqing it's not going to be the right fix but i mean sometimes you can do that with like studio stuff like bounce it as another track turn up the volume and who cares and then eq it to balance it i i don't know but that's a common issue where sometimes you can't eq that problem away like I can't just EQ her voice to make her no, fit into the mix in that because she's gonna go to some yeah yeah that's that's definitely an arrangement issue there in right. that particular setting and you have to like understand you know how the voice works like studio version with the male singing he's probably belting and so he's got he's singing a different register you're right. you have different overtones and different frequencies whereas she, in that same register in her voice well that same uh that same uh range she's not getting those higher frequencies to help bring out bring her out through the the rest of the ensemble that's a that's an important point here too is that is the overtones and the harmonics i think that's a key aspect of eq that a lot of people when they're learning about it don't understand is that you know everything we're producing all of these frequencies like even though you're singing middle c you've got the overtones that are happening above it and there's even some subharmonic stuff too yeah Um, if you if you just had that middle c going then that would be a sine wave exactly right you know (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) so that the the overtones the harmonics that are there changes the timbre of what of what you're hearing because like what brian's saying is the the sine wave you know you're saying that's that's just a, a single fundamental with no harmonics. So, yeah. um, and when you're EQing, like if you EQ a voice and you EQ this high frequency, it's way higher than what they're actually singing. You're you're messing with their overtone series. So, it, it's kind of like how an acoustic guitar sounds different if you're playing picked versus using your fingers, and even from just like picking, depending on how close to the bridge or how close to the sound hole or how close to the neck you're playing and you have different yeah. timbres within that. Yeah, exactly. And in, so, in, a, in a studio situation, you, you need to think about those things before when you're recording to kind of like basically EQ before you EQ. Yeah. And, and it's what you're saying. I mean, I agree the the arrangement makes a huge difference. I had one circumstance I was doing live sound and I was just having a tough time getting everything work, you know, getting them, there was like three keyboard players and I was just having a tough time getting them to all fit and hear what they're each playing. And then I looked down and I was like up on the balcony and I looked down and I look on their hands and all of them have like two hands 
right around middle C. And I'm like, okay, that's why I can't get this to work. Because they're all yeah. playing in the same range. I'm like, somebody play up here. Somebody play down here. Um, but I didn't have any control of that. So I was just like, okay, it's just this mush. But like, I had the same thing. I had somebody that was a bass player. And his mix was just all all kinds of low frequency things. They're really cool things, synths and real bass and other things happening. And I'm like, oh, you got to do, you got to do stuff all over the place. And that's what like an orchestra is a great example, and a good orchestrator. And you look at these symphonies that have t- have stood the test of time, and you listen to what they're doing, and they're playing all these things in different registers. And you know, I always joke about when I talk about this with. The viola. There's a reason why a viola, even though it sounds horrible, fits in the orchestra. (laughs) Because it does. It fits with everything else. And it's like this mix that's happening. It fills a certain section of sound that's needed. Well, Um, in like my private voice lessons, we were talking about like singing in an opera. And you have to learn how to sing a certain way classical music so that you can get those overtones to fit in your place. You're literally mixing well you're basically eqing without using like scuro, a, right yeah scuro. Yeah. so i want to we're we're getting close to time um but i want to cover one last technique it's probably the most common one we had yeah. talked about using eq charts for um kind of giving you reference points to eq from great idea great place to start another thing that is a very common technique that a lot of people will use is they will sweep. What that means is you'll take your EQ, you'll take your Q for your parametric, you will boost the gain so that you can hear the frequencies. You might shrink the Q, so you might shrink the width of the um, the EQ down, and then you will sweep it up and down to find whatever is not sounding good because you're bringing it out more. And then when you find that sound or whatever, you can either bring it, you can bring it down again. Also, you can just boost it and be like, oh, I'm looking for something, you know, like the nice warmth in this voice I'm trying to give. Yeah. Sweeping is a good way of finding that. As you get more familiar with EQing and as you do it more often, you will not have to sweep as much. You just say, oh, yeah, I can tell it's in around 200 because you can start to see common problems in certain locations like two to 300, you know, eight to 1K, 800 hertz to 1K, you know, 2K is a problem frequency, sometimes 12K. And I'm just spitballing different frequencies. But yeah, sweeping is how you get to that point where you just reach for the EQ and you know, I want to remove this or I want to add this here. You can also read about it from other people who have those experiences, but it's also good to sweep and learn because your ears and learning how to hear is what's going to make you a better engineer. Yeah. When it comes, when it comes down to it, it is really your ears and you think, Oh, I'm making decisions from what I see when you're like writing something or, or when you're, you know, you're painting something, you're doing the same thing here. You're making, making decisions based on what you hear and it's just a sense that has to be developed further to be like, yeah. oh, what am I hearing? What needs to be, you know, boosted? What needs to be cut for to accomplish these goals of frequency masking or making it sound better or, or something like that? Yeah. When you're like EQing, don't pay attention to the way that the EQ looks, but don't be afraid to make big boosts or make big cuts or do small, small boosts, small cuts, but just don't pay attention to how the EQ looks and pay attention to how the set, how the EQ affects your source. Yeah, I agree with that. There's two reasons why one, what you're seeing isn't always what's being done. And two, it's not good to use a visual reference for something when you're using your ears. Those are the two reasons why what Brian says is like really important. Cause like, I'm sorry, the X32 I don't like the way it visually looks on the EQs. I, I can hear what it's doing and I don't feel like it's as accurate of a visual representation as some other EQs I use with live sound stuff. In any case. I agree. The visual, I think it's such a crutch sometimes that people are like, what, it, what should it look like, you know, to be right? And it's like, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It matters what it sounds like. And yeah. Ultimately, it's more about why you're doing what you're doing than it is about what you're doing. And I, I, I just want to iterate that because I think a lot of times people are like, oh, I, just tell me what your settings are. And that's not the answer. The answer is why they're doing their settings. That's the more important question to ask. Um, yeah. yeah. So awesome. Thank you for coming or thank you for listening into episode two of
Audio Bros Studio Episode Pros. Two. Episode two. <laughs> dun, dun. No, I'm just kidding. Um, awesome. <laughs> Thank you guys two. for tuning in. Episode three will be on dynamics. Oh boy, we've already kind of touched a little bit on that today. Um, we brought up some things like side chain compression and other things. <laughs> um, as as Ben loves. <laughs> Hey, side, side chain compression's chain. not evil. It's just it's not, not it's not evil. Everything. It's just no, it has its place. It's just it really does. overused. Yeah. yeah. With that, next episode, episode three of the Soundcast Dynamics. And cut. <laughs> <laughs>